Hey, good morning, everyone. I'm Diana Rabb, and I'm going to talk about writing for transformation and healing. But I'm first going to talk a little bit about my writing journey, which started many years ago uh, when I was 10 years old. And uh, my grandmother had committed suicide in my childhood home. And it was the 60s, and my mother really didn't know quite what to do. And so she handed me a Kaha Gibran journal, and she said, write your story. Just write to your grandma. Just write, write, write. So from that day on, I found writing to be a very healing part of my life. I wrote during my difficult adolescence, hippie in the 60s. I wrote about three pregnancies on bed rest, a daughter with drug addiction, three cancers, and blah, 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 blah. All the other stuff that we all go through on, on our journey. Spalding holds a very special place in my heart, and this is why. In 2001, I was diagnosed with breast cancer, and my husband asked me, if you were to do anything you wanted right now, what would that dream be? And I said, go back for my MFA. And coincidentally, I just opened a writer's magazine it was not actually, I think the internet really wasn't big that back then because I don't think we used packets through the, I think we had to mail packets to our, <laughs> to our uh, mentors. And so I found an ad for Spalding and I said, wow, this looks amazing. So I called, I can't remember who I spoke to, Cena or Karen, both of them perhaps. And they said, yes, you can apply. And I said, oh my gosh, I'm so excited. Uh, and then I was trying to figure out what program to, dis to apply into, and I was working on a young adult novel at the time, and I submitted my manuscript, and it was accepted, and I celebrated, uh, and with the condition that I would maybe be transferred into CNF or fiction later on, because I was, and oh, I, I, that's right, they told me that I had, had to be in the children's division because that's where the opening was. And I said, OK, I'm so happy to be there. I will be in and maybe get a minor in nonfiction. So backtracking a bit, I had surgery in August. This program was supposed to start in October. And I called uh, Sina and Karen. And I said, you know, I really want to start this program. It's my life's dream. I don't know where my life is headed now. Uh, and but I'm going to be really tired because I'll have had major surgery in August and your program starts in October. And they said, never mind, you want to come, you come and you just come to whatever classes you can with whatever energy you have and we just want you. <laughs> and I, I'm just so indebted to them because this program has changed my life, really changed my life. So I went to the programs, and the first day, actually, 9-11 had happened, so I was healing for myself, healing for my country. 9-11 happened, and we all didn't know whether this program was actually going to start. We were all petrified of flying. And so we somehow all got here. Cena decided to continue with the program. And I'll never forget the first day we sat in a room, and we were writing about our experience of 9-11. And it was, it was such a moving moment, and it was so... It was a way to, that we were all really brought together as a group and as a country. And so many of us, there's a bunch of graduates. Raise your hands. Who of you are were in the charter class with me? Yeah. And so we just, we, we just bonded in such a very special way. And um, I'm so grateful to Sina and Karen, because I think of them as a team. They do work together. I've never seen a team like that. They're just. You know, this celebration is definitely for Sina because she's moving on to more books. But uh, thank you so much. I don't know if I'll can I use it. <laughs> How gracious is that? <laughs> um, so as I was working on my uh, as I was working on my thesis. Uh, I ended up in this creative nonfiction department, and I was working on a um, I was working on I, f I just found my grandmother's journal. She was an orphan in World War I, and I had just found her journal. I was trying to figure out what am I going to do with this journal? I want to use it in the program. 
So as a medical journalist for many years and just writing really, you know, not really creative literary work, uh, I made that transition in my mind and I started writing about my experience with my grandmother. She was my caretaker for the first 10 years of my life. I wove that with my own, uh, um, my own life and memories of her since I found the journal 40 years after she passed away. Uh, and so I've skipped over a lot of things that I wanted to say. But So during the process of writing my memoir, uh, and I realized that I, I came to learn that for most people, one of the difficult, most difficult part about writing a memoir, writing for healing, is finding out the structure of your book. It's very, very difficult. And I think we went through 20, 20 drafts before I figured out what the structure of this memoir was going to be. And I'll never forget the moment in the cafeteria with my mentor at the time. And we just broke down in tears when we realized, this is it. This is the one. And just that feeling of revelation is, you know, and, and most all of your writers, and you know that feeling when you get that aha moment. And toward the end of the process of writing my thesis, I realized, or we realized that I had two memoirs, Regina's Closet and Healing with Words, which was about my cancer journey. Regina's Closet was about my grandmother. Healing with Words was about my cancer journey. And, and it, most of you might know the difference between a memoir and an autobiography is a memoir is about a slice of life. It's about, you know, it has a focus, it has a theme, and an autobiography is about a whole life. And typically an autobiography is written by a public figure, an actress, political figure. We have too many of those out, I think, personally. But, uh, <laughs> and so typically, uh, the theme, so my, I had two different themes in my book. I had cancer and I had Regina's Closet about my grandmother's journal, so it was two books. So in every way, writing both of my memoirs is transformative. Writing Regina's Closet was a way to honor my relationship with my grandmother, plus it was also a way to keep her alive. I never really healed from losing her, especially since I was 10 and my parents never allowed me to go to her funeral. Then I chronicled my cancer journey and even though I didn't want to publish it, many of my friends thought, you've got to do this because it'll help other women. And so the cancer book turned out to be, I always believe in sharing universal truths when you're writing nonfiction <coughs> so, and so that you're not doing all that navel gazing. So my universal truth was that I was sharing with other people how to help heal on their journey. So in that book, I have writing prompts. Uh, and Sina graciously blurred that, that book. And I was just, <laughs> I just feel so indebted to you for so many things and encouragement and ins inspiration. And, and, I'll, and later on when I did my dissertation, uh, and I know Sina has to leave, so I'm kind of filling the, fitting this all in. Uh, when I was doing my dissertation on writing for healing, I met with Sina a few times, and she was so supportive and so encouraging. And uh, we're just, we're so blessed to have her. We're really blessed to have her. It seems as if whenever I had a major shift in my life, I would turn to writing. So in 2006, I get my second cancer diagnosis. And around that time, I applied for my PhD program at the Institute of Transpersonal Psychology in Palo Alto. When deciding on a subject for my research, my PhD chair advised me to choose three areas of interest. The tip is, really help me because I think we all have more than three areas of interest, but if we're looking for an intersection, that's a really good way to home in on the idea. I'd always been fascinated by the creative process, been fascinated by psychology, and been fascinated by memoir writing. Plus, I've always been a seeker. So the intersection of these three areas became a research study about the transformative powers of memoir writing. So the exact title of my dissertation was Creative Transcendence, Memoir Writing for Transformation and Empowerment. So a transcendent experience or a pivotal experience is, a, is an experience that goes way beyond the ordinary. Compelling memoirs, and I'm sure some of you have read some, just hold your attention and that's because they express profound emotions and utilize embodied writing which are powerful tools for transformation. In most cases, people write memoir because of their burning need to share a story or to figure something out in their lives. And it's also a way to bring a family secret to the forefront, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a bit. Social psychologist James Pennebaker has done many studies on therapeutic writing. He found that using expressive writing or when journaling about upsetting experiences, narratives that have not been coherent 
become more coherent. This illustrates that transformative writing can engage you in your story. My PhD study began with 34, a list of 34 memoirs. I had to narrow it down to 34 memoirs that I loved. And I was going to do a qualitative study, and I, which means that I, was, I hate numbers because I'm a writer. So I was not going to do any surveys. I was just going to interview them. Using the process of elimination, I got it down to 25, and finally down to five. The study was informed by Maslow's theory of creativity. To collect my data, I used the memoir excerpts. Of course, I had to read all their memoirs, lectures, and personal observations. And I did all my interviews via Skype, which was fun instead of the phone, because I get to really interact with them. In general, what I discovered is that the writing experience offered these authors a chance to review their lives, find resolution and redemption, find inner peace, and establish a clarity of mind as a way to move forward in their lives. The first author I interviewed was Kim Stafford, the son of esteemed the poet William Stafford. And I'm going to finish, if, if I forget, remind me, I've got to read one of his um, meditations and poems on writing. He had a memoir that he wrote about his brother's suicide. The second author was Mark Matusik, who had written two memoirs. He was a seeker. The third was Monica Wesowelski, who also was immediately, immediately wanted to participate in the study. The fourth one was Alexandra Styron, who was the daughter of William Styron. And the fifth was Maxine Conkingston. So you can see they were all different backgrounds, but very interesting. <coughs> they all agreed <coughs> that they faced life challenges, which inspired them to write memoir. And all the challenges had to do with loss. Whether the loss was related to a brother, a father, or a child, an aunt, a culture, or a family, the experience affected them in such a profound way that they wanted to write a memoir. The results showed that each writer was changed through the writing process. I believe that our childhoods dictate who we become. My deepest childhood passions were journaling and reading memoirs. Actually, back then they were called biographies. I think memoir is a newer term. I believe that some people write memoirs because they're also motivated by higher truths which they might want to share with the universe. Psychologist Abram Maslow says that he called dedicated people devoted to some task outside themselves as their beloved job. The main questions I posed to these authors was, what was the experience that inspired you, inspired you to write the memoir? How were you transformed by writing the memoir? And how what was the impact of that experience in terms of your entire life theme? And now I'll explain the individual answers by all the authors. I found it very revealing to hear that the authors describe that their pivotal experiences, all the pivotal experiences that inspired the memoir writing. For example, Kim Stafford said that his older brother, Brett, committed suicide at the age of 40. He'd never written about his brother. But he realized that over the years, much of the dialogue and narrative that he'd written about in his journals and collected were all in the voice of his brother. So he wrote a fabulous memoir called A Hundred Tricks Every Boy Can Do. The moment of final decision to begin writing the memoir was when Kim saw that his own son was transitioning into adolescence. And he began to wonder about the circumstances about his brother's suicide. And this is actually what happened to me when I was diagnosed with cancer. I thought, ooh, maybe that's why my grandmother committed suicide. She had cancer, and you didn't talk about it in the 60s. So sometimes the inspiration to write a memoir is sparked by something happening in your own life that brings back the past. Mark Matusik said his inspiration for writing his memoir, Sex, Death, and Enlightenment, and there's no commas there, stemmed from his transcendent realization that his life as a busy writer for a New York magazine was taking a huge psychological toll on him. He felt a deep desire and need just to slow down with his life and get off the fast track. It was as, as if a voice inside him gave him that message. And if any of you were here for Beatrice's talk, we, it's amazing how if you listen to your voice is the path that it could take you. You know, and that was one of the beautiful things about her talk, which kind of coincides with mine. It's all about positivity. It's all about engaging in the present. It's all about nature. It's all about connections with people. 
so, so the voice spoke to him inside. Matusik's impetus for writing his second memoir, The Boy He Left Behind, originated from his father leaving the family when Mark was four years old, leaving him with three sisters and a mother. So essentially a house of women who totally silenced him. So he found his voice in his writing. And a lot of writers do find their voices uh, in writing because they've been silenced. The real impact of that moment hit him hard when his father returned home later and tried to kidnap him. That inspired him to write his memoir. Monica's moment arrived when she gave birth to her first child, Sylvan, who was clearly would not survive long after birth. She was already a writer and began keeping a journal about her experience. It was clear that his death would lead her to write a story of his life, which would help heal her. If you love someone, you need to let them go, she says. Alexandra Styron was a little bit different than the others I've interviewed because she was the only one in the study that was not previously a writer who had written this, a memoir. She was, well, she was a writer, she wrote a novel, but she was mainly an actress. As the one person in her family who had inherited the literary <coughs> gene of her father, William Styron, she felt really compelled to tell her story. In addition to being inspired to study and write her father's story and what it was like growing up in the same house with him, she was driven by the grander emotions of her psyche, which is why she called the book Reading My Father. She was the only one that I interviewed when she was on the playground with her kids. She just couldn't give me enough time to engage properly in a discussion, very busy New York life. I have two kids that live in New York. It's like, yeah, what do you want? <laughs> it's just a totally different vibe. I live in California. It's like, yeah, let's slow down a bit. Let's meditate. <laughs> oh, dear. Maxine Kong Hingston's inspiration, she was amazing to interview. Her I interviewed in person. She came, um, I sponsored her to read in Santa Barbara. And she came to give a reading and I pulled her aside and I said, I need to talk to you. How many of you have read The Women Warrior? Fascinating memoir. So she wrote The Women Warrior and the Fifth Book of Peace. The Women Warrior was inspired by her ghosts of her past particularly her aunt's suicide after being ostracized from the community because she had an illegitimate child in China. Of course, that was not respected now, and it certainly wasn't respected then. The, f the fact that her aunt was essentially forgotten by the family grated on Christine's psyche for her whole life. While her mother wanted her to communicate stories with the world, Kingston was told to hold them as a secret inside her. So Maxine Kahn Kingston really couldn't write her memoir until everyone passed away, and this is very often happens. Um, when I teach memoir writing, people say, well, I don't want to hurt anyone. I said, well, I just, just say let it rip. Just do it, and if you decide not to publish it, then don't publish it and, or wait till the person's passed on. But if you've got that burning need to write, just do it. Have no fear. When answering the second question, uh, Oh, I apologize. Kingston wrote The Woman Warrior as a way to explore her duality. Her impetus for writing the fifth book of peace was based around the Oakland Berkeley fires in the 1990s that caused her home and all her possessions, including a 200-page manuscript, to disappear. So she, she wrote to help you know, heal from that, that experience. When asking these writers, how were you transformed writing a memoir, Kim Stafford said that he came to a new understanding about his brother's suicide. It also reunited him in a way that he never thought possible. He felt younger. He felt like he was bringing his brother alive again. At the same time, the writing inspired him to dig deeper into his understanding of his own life. It forced him to pose more questions and tell stories. Most importantly, he shared with me that, that he realized that relationships really don't end with death. They go on forever. And sometimes, after someone dies, their life becomes magnified. And maybe it's because we can't hold on to them, we can't call them, we can't see them. Mark Matusik said he was immediately transformed by living the past of his life, growing up in the house with three sisters and a mother, and never having a voice. So he was able to find his voice through writing. He also realized that living as a child without a father, he felt there was something really missing. 
In writing his memoir, he understood what that reason was, and it made him feel whole again. It also helped dissipate his feelings of pain. Monica felt a deep sense of urgency in writing her memoir about her son who died when he was very young. And ultimately, <coughs> it helped her heal. Luckily, she journaled through the whole experience, so she felt stronger. Alexandra said, and I don't know that I believe her, but she said she was transformed through her writing. I think she felt, sometimes, because I'm friends with a couple of writers who have had esteemed parents as writers, and they don't always feel like they want to write about their parents or get involved, but they feel this compulsion, this need to do it because they're left with the, the responsibility. She was left with all his, you know, documents. She found in the process, ho however, she found some very undesirable memories of her past, but she wa was always sweeping under the carpet. She realized that rather than being, than being a form of transformation, retelling her father's story was a, was a way to manage her false sense of intimacy with him in that she held on to satisfying snippets of information as a mirror into her life. Maxine Hong Kingston was transformed by retelling the stories of her past. She also re loved re-examining the territory which she hasn't viewed in many years. She felt as if her childhood had been lost and she loved writing about it. The third question I asked is what was the impact on your memoir on your overall life theme? And I believe we all have life themes. And when I teach journaling, I say, when people say, how am I going to use these journals? And I tell them, you know, probably 95% of what you write in your journals is trash. You might find 5% of gems that you can turn into something. But what I tell them to do is to highlight the themes. Like if they keep writing about one person or one thing, one issue, then those would be the themes that you can kind of tie together in your life. So when I asked him what was his life theme, he said it was, Kulinia, which is a Hawaiian means of freedom to tell stories and honor the importance of communication. When he realized that he could tell his brother's life in suicide, he experienced a certain amount of freedom, and writing does that. Writing gives us freedom. Gets it out of our heart, out of our heads, onto the page. Writing his memoir encouraged him to pose even more questions about his father and his brother. He began questioning the effect his parents had on his brother's life, and were they a cause, or do they, they have to, anything to do with his suicide and his sadness? Because as we know, suicide is often a result of depression. Like Stanford, Mark Matusik's life theme had revolved about posing questions, and I found that all of them actually, were, since they were kids, they always posed questions. I think curiosity is really important as a writer. We have to be curious. And when Matusik was writing, he ha felt a sense of wonderment about how to deal with his hunger in the most productive and effective way. He came to the realization that survivors are seekers. Another thing that came up in the previous talk was gratitude, which I kind of add into that because I think the main key to, to happiness is gratitude. If you see the happiest people in the world, you talk to them, they have a lot of gratitude. Talk to those that are not happy, no gratitude. And I know there's a lot of yucky things happening right now, but there's a lot of beautiful things happening in the world, which, which I hope um, we all can write about even more. Monica said that she was a great journal keeper, so pulling together the story of her son's life was keeping with the theme of being a creative writer. Styron began to understand her deep psychic connection with her father and their mutual sense of humor and she tried to incorporate the narrative of her own book with his life story. So in conclusion, all five authors who I interviewed were similar in their desire for transparency and for revealing family secrets. They all conceded that secrets made them feel uncomfortable and ill at ease. They had to get them out. And the reason they didn't early, early is because of fear. And that was one of the first things my father-in-law said to me when I was diagnosed with breast cancer, because he survived World War II, have no fear. For each writer, the resolution came forth when the secrets were exposed, which ultimately led to transformative empowerment and eventually their respective memoirs. In addition to these findings, there's some interesting other data that I came up with. The five authors expressed a deep need to write their memoirs, feeling as if they were the only ones that could tell them. No one else. 
And even though you grow up in the house with someone else that wants to write a memoir, and I think uh, Tobias, not Tobias, um, Jeffrey, Jeffrey Wolf and Tobias Wolf both wrote memoirs, totally different memoirs, totally different perspective on life. So even if you are writing a memoir, it would probably be different from someone you grew up with. But basically, that gets down to you're writing your own emotional truth, no one else's. And that was a sticker from one of my mentors here that I had on my computer. <laughs> Write your emotional truth. So we all have different emotional truths, thank goodness. And also, you're writing from your heart, necessarily, not necessarily from your head, because our head messes with us sometimes. Not that our heart doesn't, but <laughs> our heart fools us, too. So the, the author said that they had to get something out of their system. All the authors identified themselves as curious and inquisitive and yearned for profan profound knowledge about why the, the whys and ifs of their experience. All of them confessed that the reason they, had, they wrote the memoir was to figure something out. It's always good to start a memoir with a question. My question to my was, why did my grandmother commit suicide? The same with Kim Stafford and the same with Maxine Kong Hingston. By writing their memories, all five authors indicated they can find that they were able to finally let go of a story that they've been holding on to their whole lives, alluding to the fact that writing was a way for them to come to terms with it. In doing so, they each attained spiritual and personal transformation. All of them said that while writing their memoirs, they were offered the opportunity to make connections with others who shared valuable information, which is kind of fun, too, because you can connect with people that have information about your life or someone you're writing about. So they were all pleased to write their memoirs. Uh, another thing I learned during the study was that in addition to bringing out a sense of personal transform transformation, the act of sharing stories in memoir writing it was a way of connecting them to their community, connecting them to their family. It was really a way of bringing everybody together, which is a beautiful thing. Human stories do bring us together, and they foster and encourage compassion for one another. During my research, I realized that research can be transformative also for the researcher. Much of the joy in doing my work originally from my interest in memoir writing. My passion for the subject was obvious during my interviews, which helped me connect with the authors. So why write a memoir? When discussing memoirs as a creative endeavor with these five authors, I concluded that memoir writing was a creative expression and a transpersonal practice that increased self-awareness, promoted healing, is transformative, elicits feelings of empowerment, plus it leads to a better understanding of our lives and the lives of those we love. Throughout my study, another factor really struck me, and that is how long it took each writer to write the memoir. I know in my case, my grandmother died in 61. I didn't write my memoir till 2001. <laughs> it took me 40 years to have the courage to, to write my memoir. Um, my dad, who was a Holocaust survivor, uh, died in 91. I still can't even write an essay about him. So I think everyone's different. Uh, I think. Distance really helps because as an adult, we can put perspective uh, onto the experience and have, bring the wisdom to it. Throughout the study, another factor repeatedly struck me in that, okay, so how long it took them. The more I understood the process the authors described, the more my focus shifted toward the positive pull that they were experiencing. So the experience basically made them feel much more whole and much more healthy. In summary, my findings suggest that the authors I interviewed were transformed and empowered by the experience and process of writing full lake memoirs. In some cases, the writers began with one mission. For example, Kim Stafford started to write because he wanted to find out why his, why his brother died, committed suicide. But in the end, he realized that writing helped keep his brother alive. So you can start out with one mission and end up with another one, which is beautiful. As a result, the memoir is connected with deeper reflections or illuminations about their experiences and their roles in the larger context of their lives. This change, is in direct, this change in direction during the writing process also illustrates the role of creative flow in the writing process. Just go with it. Just go with the flow. That's why I don't like outlines, because they really restrict us. Actually, I usually write my books, and then I outline after as a way to get things in order but everyone has their own process. 
Writing about lived experiences was a way for authors to bring meaning into their lives as well as to make sense of their experiences. So resolution and closure was a big part of their writing process. My hope in doing my study was to provide inspiration for others also wanting to share their story, whether in the form of poetry, memoir, or fiction. The sense of transformation and empowerment is the shining star, the reward, the monumental task of cracking the egg open of one's life, writing it down, reflecting on it, and coming to a new understanding of one's experience. So my publicist says I have to give a little pitch because my new book just came out, Writing for Bliss. And this book is basically a culmination of my life's journey. And it's also a culmination of the research that I shared uh, with you this, this, uh, this morning. And it also offers some helpful tips in writing memoirs and writing poetry, but all revolving around personal writing. The book has re received some real stellar reviews, and my publisher calls me his three crown author because I had a publisher's review, forward review, and Kirkus review. But one review really warmed my heart, and the person said, It's like your book is Natalie Goldberg meets the Dalai Lama. <laughs> I'm like, wow, I was so touched. Because I really do try to share some wisdoms that I learned on my own journey. And uh, some people that are not writers even read it and loved it. Uh, so now I'm doing two companion books. One is going to be a journal, of course. And another one is a book of wisdoms on bliss. So that's the end of my talk, but I'd love to answer any questions anybody has.